and then I'm going to ask you which names stand out. So it, here's the test. One, two, three. Okay, is there any name that jumped out at you from that? No. It was still a garbled mess? Okay. Uh, can we turn this down just a little bit? Unless you like hearing me that loud. I don't like hearing me that loud. Um, the, the, the whole point of that is when, when the psalm starts, how majestic is your name? It's basically like God saying his name is that much greater, that much louder. It speaks that more boldly than all the other names. There's a whole bunch of other gods. There's a whole bunch of other things that you could worship or things that you could be doing on Sunday or things that people try to give credit for everything that you see outside. But it's like God is screaming his name at the top of his lungs and he expects it to stand out from all the rest. Does that make sense? That's the point of this song. Now, sometimes when we read the Psalms, we can get stuck in this idea that there's no structure. It's just one Psalm is just, you can sort of hand pick. There's the Psalms just are all a big conglomeration of individual writings and songs. And it, I can see why that's the case and why people think that, but there is actually structure and there's flow and there's organization to the Psalms. And we're in the middle of one of those right now. And I think it's important because it, it helps us to understand the purpose of Psalm 8 in particular. So Psalm 1 and 2 are introductory psalms to a bigger section of the first five, or first of five big sections in the book of Psalms. And in the first of the big sections, there's also five subsections. And the first of those five subsections goes from chapter, th or chapter 3 to chapter 14. Okay? So ver chapter 1 and 2 are just an introduction to actually the whole book of Psalms, and it introduces it this way. In the first chapter, it says that the person who lives according to what God says and how God wants us to live, especially as it reveals in the Bible, that person will be solid, firm, won't be shaken, will be productive, will be happy, will be joyful, and won't blow away like the chaff. And so this is it's setting the stage that there is a possibility that when all the other circumstances of life are going poor, there can be people who stand firm in the midst of that. The second chapter introduces a king, and it introduces this mighty king that's going to come that everybody else doesn't want to be king, and this mighty king that's going to come is going to rule and ha rule with justice and, and mercy and all these different things. So it's introducing both the plight and the difficulty of man, but the hope that there is for man, and then the promise that there's going to be a king coming. Now, in the midst of that, the first grouping of Psalms of chapter 3 to chapter 14 are all Psalms of David, and they're all written during the time of incredible struggle for David. So the first, uh, so chapter 3 to chapter 7, it sort of lays out this idea that he, of times when he was depressed, when he was stressed out, when he was anxious, when he was nervous, when he was worried, when he was pursued, all these different things. And then we have chapter 8 in the middle, which is unique. It's different than the, all the other Psalms in this chunk. And then you pick up chapter 9 to chapter 14, and chapter 9 to 14 talk about the enemies of David and what happens when people oppose and push back. Can we still trust God? And so then we get chapter 8 sort of right in the middle here, and it starts off, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then from the mouths of children and infants you have established praise. And then it's, it says, when I look at the heavens, the works of your hands, then it asks this question, verse 3 and 4, what is man that you're mindful of him? Who am I? And so it's gonna, it looks at these first few chapters when David looks at, at his life and he's stressed out, he's worried, he's frustrated with life, he's constantly pursued, he's going through difficult times. And then it's like in chapter 8 he pauses and he looks up at the stars and he says, okay, this is big, this is huge, how cool is it that you even see me? And so God looks at the oppressed, he looks at those who are distressed and worried, who are pursued and have enemies and all these other things, and God knows them and he keeps them and he sustains them. That's the purpose of Psalm 8, right in the middle of all the difficulty, it elevates who God is and it puts our problems in the right place, in the right perspective. Let's pray, and then we're going to read Psalm 8 together. Father God, we thank you for your word. Um, I know we can sometimes lose perspective looking at our own circumstances, and, and when we get our eyes 
inward focused on our problems and worries, sometimes it's good to stop and to look up and then to ask that question, who am I that you'd even care about me? But we thank you that you do, that you see us, you know us, you, you, uh, you work on for us and you sustain us and you keep us and you protect us and, and you rule in that way. And so we thank you for that. We ask now that you just strengthen our hearts by this psalm today. Encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above all the heavens, and out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength or praise because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And when I look at the heavens and the work of your hands or of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly things or angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the seas. Yes, I have dominion over them. I will catch one one of these days. The fish of the seas, whatever passes along the paths of the seas, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So you will see, and you, you probably noticed that verse 1 and verse 9 are the same, correct? That's what we call in Hebrew poetry an inclusio. It's like two parentheses or two brackets on either end of the sentence. And so we have this, and what we usually, what that usually means is that Everything in the middle explains the things that are on the outside. Okay, so the two parentheses are God is elevating his name. How? How is he elevating his name? That's all explained in the middle. And so that's what we're going to look at today. How is he explaining, or how is he yelling out his name? And he's doing that through creation, of course, which we see. But he's also doing that through man and through his plan that, that he's established. He's established design. He's established creation. He's, he's put these things and, and put structures and order. All of these things are to give him glory. So let's, let's look at the very first verse just briefly. And I want to note something that's really interesting. He says, O Lord, our Lord. Now in your Bible, it, it should have O, the first Lord being capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Does everyone see that? Yeah, okay. That's, that is the name Yahweh. It is the personal covenant relational name that he has revealed to his people. So he says, here is who I am. This is my reputation. This is who I promise to be. And so this, you can trust this name. This is the name that I'm going to stand by. So he's revealed himself. He's personal to the people of Israel, especially. And it wrapped up in his name are many, many promises that he made to his people. So it says this, O Lord, Yahweh, that personal name, Yahweh, Adonai. Adonai basically just means master or the boss, okay? Oh, Lord, you're a personal God, but you're also above all others. You are great. Oh, Lord, our Lord, meaning that there's, this, there's a personal relationship that we have, and that relationship is me and God are not on the same level. God is here. I am down here. Does that make sense? Okay. So, yes, he's personal, but buddy, buddy, I can tell God what to do and he can tell me what to do? No. God is the one that is over all things. So, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then it says, you have set your glory above the heavens. This is all God planned, God ordained, and God brought it out. You have set is this idea that God did all the things that he did on purpose. And when he did them on purpose, it was to bring him glory. The word glory, biblically, is basically weighty treasure. And we've talked about this before. I'm going to try to give you a big definition, or a little definition for a very big concept. It's weighty treasure. It's something that is valuable, incredibly valuable, but it's also something that's like, there's a heaviness to it. There's something that's, whew, that's good stuff. That's kind of the idea, okay? So it's not light and fluffy like a bag of feathers. It's like a giant bag or a chest of gold. There's value there's weight. And when we think of God in that way, there's something weighty and precious and amazing about God that's different than everyone else, okay? So his glory is his weighty treasure, the value, the splendor of who he is, 
And this whole idea of majesty, how majestic or excellent or famous above all others, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so he's setting up his glory. He's trying to elevate who he is um, by what he's done, the order of the way things are created and, and, and all these different things. Now verse 2. So out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength. Everyone pinch your babies so we can hear them. Yeah? Okay. This is why I love the sound of kids in church. It's a good thing. There's something that's very natural um, in that. So uh, does that mean that they, sh- we sh- they should lead the worship team? Maybe. No, that, that's not what's being said here. Out of the mouths of babies. And why? Why bring up children or babies and infants? Because... And this is what's going to be true uh, from this whole section of Psalms is that because God chooses to use the weak to praise him the most. So those who are the weakest, the most vulnerable, remember who David was? When he was worried, he was frustrated, he was scared, God was still watching over him and and using him to bring him glory and to bring him praise. And this is a pattern that's going to be set up through the scriptures. So I want to just take you briefly with with this in mind because Jesus uses this verse in Matthew 21, out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established praise because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So why is he using weak things, babies, little babies who aren't doing anything for him? I want you to note that. That's really important. So your ability to do something for God does not necessarily bring him more glory. So your strength doesn't actually equal more glory for God. Does that make sense? So sometimes we do that, and we're guilty of this in the church. Oh, that person would be a great board member because they have this ability, this ability, this talent. This, they're awesome. They, they would be awesome in church. And God might be saying, well, not necessarily. What if I want to use that weak person? What if I want to use that person who, who just loves me and just wants to sing his heart out? Can't God use that person just as much to bring him glory? Absolutely. And so it's not about our abilities and what we bring to the table. It's about who God is and what he's doing through weak things like you and me. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. He's just rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Okay? He comes as, he's coming in as a king. Yes. Humble and riding on a donkey, which we've seen. So he's coming in. Uh, We're going to pick this up in a little bit. But Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem And then he goes into the temple, and he clears the temple of the money changers, and there's all these people doing business, and they've muddied muddied the the temple. Remember that? And then all the other people, and he's going around, and he's healing people like crazy. Let's go go down to verse 14. Um, The blind blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he, he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple... Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never heard or never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing uh, babies, you have prepared praise. I'll tell you why that is a pretty stinging rebuke. Back in Psalm 8, which these Pharisees and religious people would have known, they're trying to say, Jesus, you need to shut these people up. They have, we're the religious leaders here. We'll set out what is good, what's, what is real worship, and, and how we do this religion thing. And Jesus says, no. Haven't you ever heard that out of the mouths of babies and infants you've ordained praise? For what purpose in chapter 8, in Psalm 8? To silence whom? The foes and the enemies, the avenger. So in a, in a sense, Jesus is saying, you know, you really, Pharisees, you religious leaders, you're the ones that are opposing me. You're the foes and the enemies, so you are the ones that need to be quiet because the babies and infants are the ones giving praise. And so in, in this way, is, in, I'll explain this in, in another way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In a way, he wants to shut up all the accusations, all the, the things that people throw at, well, you're a terrible person. You know, how, how could you do anything that would please God? And you might think that in your own head. That's a lie right from Satan, just so you know. 
you can't do anything to please God. You're, I know what you're like in private, and you have all these words in, in your mind. There could be nothing that, that you can do that would bring God any praise and any glory. You're, you're too weak. You're too stupid. You don't have any talents. You don't have any abilities. And God is saying, no, I've chosen the weak things of the world to shame the wise. And, and in doing this, he's, what he's doing is silencing the enemy. Well, how does he silence the enemy? Let's, let's look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were very wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world um, even things that are not to bring, uh, bring to nothing the things that are, so that all, no human being might boast in the presence of God. See, it's not about you and what you bring to the table. It's about God. God is establishing glory for himself, not for you. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. A lot of big words we don't need to get lost in right now. So that as it is written... Let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. So when the enemy comes and says, you are worthless and you are despised, you would just say, you're right. I am. But Christ came to die for me. And so that is where my worth is. So what does that do? Does that elevate you? No, that elevates the greatness and the glory of who God is. So the whole purpose for calling weak things is so that we can't say, well, I made God. No, God made us. And so this whole idea is it turns the tables of the accuser and the enemies of God uh, on their heads. And say, you know, and Jesus is also making a claim in that Matthew passage. He's not just calling the religious leaders the enemies of God in this way, but he's also saying that he is God. He's saying, out of the mouths of children and infants, you've ordained praise. Well, who are they praising? Jesus. And from Psalm 8, we know that that praise was only due to God. So let's go to Matt, back to Psalm 8. And just like I tried to summarize at the beginning, when I look up at the heavens, the works of your hands, or the fingers, the moon and the stars, that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Now, when you go outside, how many stars can you see? A lot. <laughs> okay. That's a good number. Somebody, some, I don't know if this is true or not. Somebody said with the naked eye, you can see about five to 10,000 stars on a good clear night. If you were given even a pair of binoculars, you could spot in, in the hundreds of thousands of stars. If you were given something like a great telescope, like a, an observatory type telescope, you'd be in the billions of stars that you could see. So when you look at the vastness even of our universe, when we even, how many of you have stood in the ocean? You stood in the ocean? Knock you over? Yeah? So there's something bigger at play than just you as a little human being. Right? So when I look at the heavens, the works of your fingers, basically God built all this stuff just with his fingers and his word. Who am I? If it's that big, how is it that you see? So what is man, first of all, that you are mindful, that you know, that you see, that you understand who I am? That's pretty amazing. That's an amazing statement of David, that you know me, you know me individually and personally, and that you're thinking about me. So just, let's keep it that simple. What is a son of man? A son of man is just a, the, a common term to remind us of our humanity. What is it, the, the son of man, that you care for or you visit, depending on your translation? Not only are you, do you know us and see us, and you're thinking about us, but you're involved with us. So why on earth would God be involved? And so this is one of the, the lies of the enemy when he wants to come in and create things like, uh, the enemy wants to do things like evolution or theistic evolution, like God started it all and then just step back and, well, let's hope this works out. No, it do doesn't work that way. It, it says that not just, not just creation, he sustains all things, we know that from Hebrews 1, but it's also true that, that God is, at play and at work in the lives of individual people. And so if God is mindful, thinking of us, he's also involved intimately with us, that's pretty amazing. I hope you see that. But it's not because you bring anything to the table, but because 
He loves you. There's something unique going on about our relationship and how God has viewed us in creation. So in Genesis, it says that God created all things, and then the crowning point of that creation was that he created man, and he says, let us, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, and he does this uniquely for human beings. We are image bearers of God. In what way? Well, we get that explained here. Yet you have made him a little lower than the angels, the heavenly beings. I thought, I thought we were the crowning, crowning point. Well, we are. We're unique that we were created in his image to bear his glory and, and his traits and to rule in his stead. Heavenly beings or angels are unique in their power or their strength. Like they're, they're more powerful in the spiritual realm than we are for sure. They also operate within his presence. They're more glorious and splendor and in the way that they were made and so on. But they were just made unique to be servants in that way. And we were uniquely made in his image to do something different. So yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings or the angels and crowned him, human beings, with glory and with honor. So when it says that we were crowned and we are image bearers, I'm going to give you uh, a description in the next verse now of what that really means. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. So God said, I made all of this. Here's the authority, here's the responsibility, and here's uh, the task that you have. Do the task in my stead. Rule over, take care of this earth. Uh, you know, look after the animals. Make sure that, uh, that it's being looked after. And then use it. Enjoy it. Let it make you happy. Explore it. And then make sure you know how to govern and to, and to take care of it. Because that is the task that I've given you in my stead. I'm going to give you a crown, given the authority and the, the splendor. Um, and so here's your task. Why? So someone once said, the chief end of man. Does anyone know what the chief end of man is? Or th what's our sole purpose? To glorify God and, and to enjoy him forever. So if our chief end is to glorify him, that is, in how we live should point to God. We don't do that by tr trying to bring glory to ourselves. We recognize our weakness and we give credit and praise and thanksgiving to God for who he is and what he's doing. And then we turn back and we, in our amazement, in our praise, and our thanksgiving, we look at everything that God's doing and we say, thank you. Again, we turn that back to the Lord. And when we enjoy the things that God has made, how many enjoy a good meal once in a while? It's a way to follow in the will of the Lord. It's the way God made us. You're pleasing to the Lord when you do that. This is why we pray and we give thanks before a meal. And so we, 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 to enjoy him and to enjoy his presence and to enjoy his gifts is, is part of the, the chief end or the purpose of life. And when we try to rob God of his glory, Romans 1 warns us that we are in danger of his wrath. So when we try to bring all this enjoyment is just for me. When we become greedy in it, we don't give God glory or credit or praise. We're in danger of his wrath. So, what does it mean to be in the image of God? To be in the image of God is to do what he does. He is, he is over all things, remember? He is the ruler. And so when it says that he has set us with dominion over the rest of the world, that is what it means to be image bearers of God. It is to rule in his place. And so we, we are given this as a representative of who God is here on the earth. And so in, in that way, we have a unique calling that the angels don't have. They're called to minister then to us. And eventually, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are going to judge the angels. And we have a unique calling even that in, in the meantime, I think we're going to go here in just a second, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to wrap everything up here with Hebrews 2. In Hebrews 2, the writer of Hebrews is going to make the connection of Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the connection to Jesus, because Jesus being God, stepped down into humanity for a time. And when he came down into humanity, everyone looked at him as weak. People rejected him. He was not uh, glorious in figure. He was very human. He wept. He was hungry. He was tired. He went through all the weaknesses that human beings go through. 
even up to the point where he suffered and he also died, as we as humans do. We, we suffer and we die. And in so doing, though, he did not stay dead. And when he suffered and he died, he purchased for us something that would then elevate us above all the angels, above everything else. You see, Jesus didn't die for the angels. There was angels that rebelled against him, just as we are rebellious and sinful and disobey him constantly. But Jesus didn't die for the angels. He came and died for human beings. And in so doing, he gave us life and hope for the future. So let's read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For it was not for angels or to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while, is added here, for a little while, lower than the angels. So there is in the writer of Hebrews' mind that this was a temporary thing. Just as Jesus, it was temporary that he would be lower than the angels, so it also is going to be for us. There's going to be a time coming when we will be elevated as well. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see the everything in subjection to him. You see, this, this world is broken, correct? So there is coming a time, there is future glory that we're thinking about here as well. But we see him who, for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death. Why? Why might he taste death? For everybody. So this is for, just like we see in Psalm 8, from his hand, from his hand, from what he does, what he does, what he does. See, when God is mindful, I want you to know that he's, he's thinking of you, he knows you, and then he visits and he cares for. So not only does he know who you are, he also knows your weakness. This is why it says in Romans that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew that he was coming to a broken world of people that rebel and, and of people that are sinful people. So don't be waiting and saying, well, I'll try to get my life in order, then God will God will maybe be thankful or be happy with me, then maybe I can experience his goodness. No, you can experience his goodness in your present state. He doesn't want to leave you there. He doesn't want to leave you in your present state of rebellion. He wants to transform that and give you a new life. And that would be for his glory, because you didn't deserve it at all. And that's why grace is mentioned in Hebrews. This is an incredible divine gift that God's given. Because all of us, if we were really honest, we would know that we don't deserve anything that we get from God aside from being squashed like a bug. Unless you're looking at the person next to you and you think, well, at least I'm better than them. It's like a bear attack and being faster than the person that you're with. But it doesn't work that way with God. We don't meet his standard. None of us do. And so the fact that he's mindful of us, knowing what we need, knowing our desperate state, knowing our affliction, knowing the worry, the anxiety, the sin, the rebellion, all these different things that are going on in our life, and then he steps in. What's the son of man that you care for him? That you would visit, that you would come down, that you would lower yourself in that way, that you would step out of heaven and step down onto earth and suffer with. That's empathy, to suffer with. It's compassion, to care for. And so he suffers with, and he suffers for. He did something that we couldn't do because he was perfect, and in so doing, he tasted death for us. And then, did he stay dead? No. He gives us this hope of a res resurrection, of new hope and glory. And so there, this is a great psalm. And so all of these things are for his glory. And they're, they're playing out uh, all around us. So next time you go out at night, I hope you ask that question. I hope you go outside, look at the stars, and say, who am I? You get a little time in creation. Who are you that God would think about you, that he would know you, and that he would step in and do something about your current state? What a great psalm for those who are afflicted, oppressed, worried, anxious, nervous, guilty, ashamed, and then those who are opposed and oppressed. What a great psalm to just stick in the middle of there.
O Lord, our Lord, how great is your name. Let's pray. Father, as we go to the communion table, we just ask that you would be honored even by the, the, the bread and the cup that we take in remembrance of what you have done. This is not something that we've created. It's not something that we've made up. It's something that you did on our behalf. And uh, so I just thank, thank you, and we want to pray that what would pour out of our hearts would be thanksgiving. Lord, if there's people that uh, don't know you, I just pray that they would uh, come, come to terms with who you are, that you know them, that you care about them, and that you have stepped down and you have died for them as well. Uh, their sins have separated them from you, and so we just ask that um, even as we take communion, that it would be a reminder that sin had a cost, and sin needed to be paid for with blood. And so we just look to Jesus as the one that has paid that penalty so we don't have to. We give you praise for this table. We just give you glory for what you've done in Jesus' name.